I will be the chair tonight. Um, Lori Ashland is also not here tonight. And the Village Council alternate, Jerry Sims, is filling in for her. So we have we have our five members, and uh, we're ready to uh, get one here. Um, as I look at the agenda, we, we've got a lot to do tonight. And, um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm suggesting that we pull off the minutes, okay? Um, and we have three public hearings scheduled tonight. We've got uh, we've got the conditional use, uh, use application for a solar array field on Quarry Street. We've also got a brewing company conditional use application. And we've got the uh, Antioch U University Midwest Conditional Use Application for a Mobile Vending Food Truck. So we've, we've got a lot to do tonight. Um, so we've got, we've got three public hearings, and we need to make these public hearings go as smooth as possible so we can get through this. Um, the, uh, let's see here. Um, so what I want to do right now <coughs> Is, is go ahead and what, what, what are we going to do about the communications? On the communications. Um, if, if I can summarize them, if you <coughs> like, just yeah, a brief summary. Yeah, I'd, I'd like, to, like to do that. Okay, we, we received uh, letters which were um, not in favor of the solar array from Ruth Lapp, Philip King, uh, Hans Jacobson, Lauren Miller, Ryan Pearson, Laura Ellison. Mitzi Miller, Mike Kelly, and Anna Stefan Erickson. We received a letter which was uh, purely factual from John Eastman regarding the drainage issues. Uh, and we received two different letters from Energy Board, one just supporting the solar array and another with some more specific uh, information. Okay, so these letters will go into the record. Yes, they will. Okay. One, one quick question. I, I think I submitted a letter too. You are correct. Chad Stiles? Yeah who is also uh, not in favor of the solar array. Okay, okay. Um, so, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and we're going to start the, uh, the, the conditional use application. Uh, we're going to have uh, Tamara Ennis. Um, she is our, our staff personnel, and she's going to, to give the review on this project. After she has given the reviews, we're going to give um, Antioch, uh, uh, they're going to have a presentation on the solar array. Okay, after that's concluded, we're going to open up our public hearing. We're going to have the public hearing in which you all will have an opportunity to say something. Uh, we're going to give you two minutes. Um, that's not a lot of time. We probably have a lot of folks here that have something to say. Um, so um, we're going to go about it that way. Uh, when the public hearing is concluded, then Planning Commission will deliberate. Um, so let's go ahead and kick this off. And Tamara, go ahead and uh, go over the uh, conditional use application. Okay, this is a conditional use application and it is also a level B site plan review. 
include um, amendment section 1268.02 for Antioch College. This is an application for a solar array field. And this is located on Cor along Quarry Street, south and north of the undeveloped Common Street right of way. The zoning district that this is located in is an e or EI Educational Institution District, <coughs> and the applicant here representing Antioch College is Reggie Stratton, and uh, there's some other people that will talk tonight also. The property owner of the property is Antioch College Corporation, and again, the request is for a conditional use and a site plan review um, to allow a solar facility in a non-residential district and let's see so the proposed solar array field will encumber portions of two parcels both parcels are owned by Antioch College Corporation the northern parcel is lot number 13 or the Antioch of the Antioch College Corporation plat and contains 42.795 acres it is mostly located along the west side of Corey Street north of the undeveloped Herman Street right away and south of the undeveloped North College Street right away. It is occupied by multiple campus buildings, including the central geothermal plant that houses the pumps for the newly installed geothermal field, an amphitheater, garden area, and walking paths. The south parcel contains 32.33 uh, plus acres. It is mostly located along the west side of Quarry Street, south of the undeveloped Herman Street right away and along the north side of Allen Street. This parcel wraps around three sides of the lot containing the Antioch College or Antioch School Building. It is occupied by Antioch's subsurface geothermal field located on the western side of the property and the food forest is being planted along Allen Street. Quarry Street runs through the eastern edge of the southern parcel and a portion of the northern parcel. A sanitary sewer main runs through the south parcel parallel to and south of the undeveloped Herman Street right of way where it connects to a sanitary main on the east side of Quarry Street. The water line extends along the western property boundary with Herman Street from Herman Street to Allen Street. Residential communities are located on the west and the south sides of the southern parcel and part of the north parcel. In addition, the Antioch school site is also zoned residential. East of Quarry Street is the pedestrian bike path and um, Glen Helen. Both are located within the conservation zoning district. The parcels themselves are within the EI um, district, which is the educational institution district, which was established to support the needs of the post-secondary educational institutions within the village. It accommodates the integration of classroom administrative, residential, and support facilities within a cohesive campus setting while acknowledging that the scale and location of the development must respect its surroundings, which are often residential neighborhoods. So the analysis of the application is that the applicant has applied for this conditional use permit in the site plan review to construct a one megawatt solar array field on approximately five acres of the south campus of Antioch College. The solar array field will consist of 20 rows of solar panels ranging from 80 feet to 475 feet in length. The field will be separated by the 20 feet wide undeveloped Herman Street right of way with seven rows of solar panels on the north side and 13 rows of solar panels on the south side. The edge of the first row of panels on either side of Herman Street right of way will be set back 35 feet on the edge. And the reason for that is that the 35 feet is a requirement in that zoning district for a front yard setback for a principal structure. The eastern edge of the solar panel rows are shown set back from the western edge of Quarry Street um, from the asphalt approximately 120 feet. Two eight feet high chain link fence enclosures are proposed to surround the solar array panels on each side of the undeveloped Herman Street right of way. The north enclosure is shown to be set back approximately 95 feet um, from the front lot line along Quarry Street and three feet from the front lot line along Herman Street, um, the undeveloped area of Herman Street right of way. The south enclosure is shown setback from, um, from the 50 feet 
Torrey Street Road easement area, approximately 95 feet also, and 25 feet from the Herman Street right-of-way. This um, fence enclosure on the south side has been set back this far to provide a minimum five feet setback from the sanitary sewer main, uh, which is also located along the south side of Herman Street. And that was um, at the request of the sanitary sewer department. The south line of the southernmost row of solar panels is approximately 220 feet from the north boundary line of the Antioch School and approximately 850 feet from the Allen Street right-of-way. The western edge of the solar panel rows will be approximately 550 feet from Antioch's west property line that abuts a residential district. The solar panels will be about seven feet tall at the north edge and two feet tall at the south edge. They will be set with a 30% slope facing south, and the spacing between rows will vary between approximately 11 feet 7 inches to 18 feet 8 inches, depending on the slope of the ground, which can increase or decrease the length of the shadowing between the rows. The panels will be mounted on posts that are set into the ground, limiting the ground disturbance and maintaining the pervious surface under each panel. In addition, there will be a main transformer that's about five and a half feet tall and a switch cabinet that's 6.67 feet tall, located on a concrete pad along the western edge of the southern enclosure. Underground electric service will be utilized, but it, is, uh, it hasn't been shown on the plans at this time. <coughs> and the proposal will minimize unnecessary tree removal with no trees being removed along Corey Street and only a few trees to the south being removed. In addition, the proposal calls for 100 new trees to be planted on the Antioch, camp, uh, on the Antioch College campus, but it does not identify the locations. Two concerns are glare and aesthetics. The concern of glare has been addressed by the developer who states that the panels are made with anti-reflective coatings to absorb as much light as possible, keeping the glare to a minimum and will have a reflectivity of around 30%, which they compare to the reflectivity of dry sand. They further state that the chain link fence will block some of the direct line of sight. However, the materials submitted uh, do not clearly identify the type of anti glare glare material or the number of layers that will be used. The concern with aesthetics is addressed basically with setback distance and by preserving the existing vegetation. There does not appear to be any additional measures on the developer's part to provide additional vegetation in the areas where vegetation is sparse between Quarry Street uh, or the residential areas. These two issues should be discussed to see if additional mitigation solutions could or should be applied and particular attention should be given to Corey Street, which runs northwest and southeast, the pedestrian bike path, and the residential districts. And then um, I list some of the, condition, um, the conditional use criteria. Um, basically, in this zoning district, a solar facility in a non-residential district is a uh, conditional use. So it is a permitted use, but it uh, is permitted as a conditional use. The, um, in that zoning district, the education, educational institution district, the, if you were to build a principal structure, then the, mini, uh, you know, the minimum set front setback from either right away, either Quarry or the undeveloped Herman Street right away, would be 35 feet. The minimum side setbacks for a principal structure would be 20 feet from the side property lines, and the minimum rear yard setback for a principal structure would be 40 feet. The maximum lot coverage that would be permitted for a principal structure would be 50%, and a maximum building height would be 40 feet. Um, in addition, the zoning district would allow a fence to be built um, in the fence um, regulations in the zoning code, which is section 126001A. The height, uh, it states that the height of fences shall not exceed four feet in any front yard including both front yards of a corner or through lot, except with the clear, um, vision, where they have the clear vision triangle, then it should be three feet tall so that uh, you can have the vis visibility for traffic. Two, fences, walls, and foliage adjacent to any public sidewalk should be set back at least one foot from the inside of the sidewalk. 
Three, visibility into and out of any driveway or street shall remain unobstructed. Four, within a side or rear yard in a residential district, no fence or wall shall be permitted. That won't really apply for this one. And five would just apply to residential districts. Six, though, states that fences in non-residential districts shall be permitted up to eight feet in height, provided that for each foot exceeding six feet, there has to be a one and one and a half foot setback from the side property lines. Um, the seven would not apply as they are not proposing to have any barbed wire or electric, electrically charged fences. And fences, walls, or foliage erected or maintained above or within utility easements shall be subject to removal as necessary to provide access to such easements. And uh, we did have a comment um, on the fence being placed so close to the sanitary sewer main uh, from the uh, sanitary department. And their comment basically is that if you uh, approve the fence within three feet of the sanitary line, then the applicant needs to be aware that if there's an emergency and the fence would have to be removed, that they would be responsible to replace it, that the village would not replace that fence uh, for them. And then the next sheet talks about the conditional use requirements and the general standards. Um, and these general standards were addressed by the applicant to some extent, but the one, um, I, I won't read through all the general standards. These, these are general standards that happen for every conditional use, uh, unless you would like me to, Mr. Sterling. And, um, but the one that I would like to point out is that um, under, yeah, uh, Tamara, I'm, I'm going to have you read all of them because these are important because when we deliberate, we basically have to find that every one of these has been met. Okay. Okay, so I think it's important at this time for you to go ahead and, and to go to uh, A through G. Okay. All right, so a conditional, conditional use requirements. Conditional uses are uses of land specifically permitted within a zoning district only with the approval of the Planning Commission, following a review of the use and its potential impact on its surroundings. These uses are generally consistent with the purpose of the zoning district in which they are permitted, but due to unique operational characteristics may not be desirable or compatible in all locations within the district. Factors such as traffic, hours of operation, noise, odor, or similar potential nuisance, nuisance effects require that the conditional use be evaluated relative to its appropriateness on a case-by-case -case basis. This chapter establishes the review procedures for conditional uses and the general standards that must be met for all conditional uses. In addition, more specific requirements are established for certain individual uses um, to mitigate their potential negative impacts. Any request for conditional use shall only be approved upon a finding that each of the following general standards is satisfied, in addition to any applicable requirements pertaining to the specific use. A, the proposed use will be consistent with the intent and purposes of this zoning code and the vision, goals, and recommendations of the Yellow Springs Comprehensive Plan and Vision, um, which is called the Yellow Springs and Miami Township uh, Comprehensive Plan and Vision. The proposed use, this is B, the proposed use will comply with all applicable requirements of this code, except as specifically altered in the approved conditional use. C, the proposed use will be compatible with the character of the general vicinity. D, the area and proposed use will be adequately served by essential public facilities and services as applicable, such as highways, streets, police and fire protection, drainage structures, refuge, disposal, water and sewers, and schools. The applicant or landowner will be required to install public utilities, streets, or other public infrastructure as required by the village, state, or other agencies to, apl uh, to applicable specifications. Dedication of said public infrastructure may be required. E, the proposed use will not involve uses, activities, processes, materials, equipment, and conditions of operation, <coughs> including but not limited to hours of operation that will be detrimental to any person's property or the general welfare by reason of excessive production of traffic, noise, smoke, fumes, glare, 
odor, or other characteristics not comparable to the uses permitted in the zoning district. F, the, proposal, the proposed use will not impede the normal and orderly development and improvement of the surrounding property for uses permitted in the district. G, the proposed use will not block sight lines from the right of way to existing signs or windows or the front or side of a building. And then we have uh, Chapter 126404, which are conditions of, of approval. Reasonable conditions may be imposed on the approval of a conditional land use in order to achieve the following. A, to ensure public services and facilities affected by the proposed user activity will be capable of accommodating increased service and facility loads necessitated by the proposed use. B, ensure that the use is compatible with adjacent conforming land uses and activities. C, protect natural resources the health, safety, and welfare, and the social and economic well-being of those who will use the land use or activity under consideration, residents, business owners, and landowners immediately adjacent to the proposed use or activity and the community as a whole. D, relate to the valid exercise of the police power and purposes which are affected by the proposed use or activity. E, meet the, purpose, meet the purpose of the zoning code be in compliance with the standards established in the code for the land use or activity under consideration and be in compliance with the zoning district standards. Staff recommendation for the proposal is that um, staff recommends that planning commission review the materials and address any concerns of the Yellow Springs citizens. In addition, staff would like the site plan to be revised to clearly identify the following. One, identify specifically what the power from the solar array will be used for. Two, identify all existing utilities on site and within the street right of, rights of way. Clearly label the size of the pipes, the type of material used, and the connection points. Three, identify the electric service lines and where they will cross the existing right of way. Um, four, identify the geothermal well locations and label the central geothermal uh, plant building. Five, identify the location of the pedestrian bike path and label uh, Glen Helen. Six, provide dimensions on the plans for the area of the solar array field. Seven, identify the sanitary sewer main in the cross section. Eight, provide east-west cross sections identifying how the line of sight will be affected from the pedestrian bike path. And then also for your information, uh, Cedarville University has constructed a 2,154 kilowatt solar array field on the northwest edge of their campus a little over a year ago. This is located at the end of Palmer Drive next to a residential development and may be worth visiting. Okay, thank you. Uh, Planning Commission, do you have any uh, questions for Tamara? Okay, we're going to move on. Um, Let's see, the, the applicant is uh, uh, Reggie Stratton. Uh, Reggie, you're, you're, in, you're the one that's presenting the uh, PowerPoint, is that right? Yes, sir. Well, come, on, come right up, please. Okay. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to uh, present our one megawatt solar array on, on South Campus tonight. Okay, with me tonight, I've, I've got a team of people that are going to help answer some of these questions, both from the Planning Commission and, and our community. I have uh, our President, Mark Roosevelt, here tonight. Andy Atkins, our Finance and Administration Manager. She's <laughs> got a demotion. <laughs> uh -oh, well, Vice President. Yes. And then a team from Solar Power and Light that are the developers for this project. I've got Brett Boyd, if you guys could raise your hand, Brett Henderson, and Wendell Ott from Energy Wise. And also Doug Hall, right here, no, right here sorry, Doug, who's the finance manager at WYSO that has uh, past experience with uh, working with EPNL and on a solar rate project for EPNL. Okay, when envisioning our solar array, 
And I ask members of the Planning Commission to think in terms of a renewable energy source, the solar array, that will power our new central geothermal plant, replacing, in essence, years of fossil fuel-based heating and cooling on our campus. That's a picture of our old power plant. The, the stack is still there, circa 1935. Um, over the years, that plant has put millions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. So what we're doing, getting rid of that, putting in its place clean renewable energy source and the most efficient heating and cooling system we could put on campus. Our central geothermal plan is estimated to offset our CO2, CO2 emissions by 2,900 tons per year and save the college approximately $400,000 a year in energy costs and maintenance costs. It will also eliminate completely the need for natural gas heating on our campus. One drawback of the Central Geo is that it's all electric and it's going to consume about 1.2 megawatts of electricity annually once it's fully implemented. This is why our solar array is very critical to this project because the solar array is going to produce about the same amount of energy for that Central Geo plant. So it's basically going to completely offset the consumption of that of that central plant. And we'll probably be, as far as we know, we'll be the only campus in the United States that can claim that our entire campus is heated and cooled by renewable energy. To finance this project, we formed this partnership with Solar Power and Light. They're a developer who seeks out an investment partner who then fronts the capital in exchange for available tax credits and incentives. Then an agreement is made whereby the college agrees to pay an electrical rate over a 25 year term for power produced from the array. The college will have an option to purchase the array after a six year period, and then I believe the other, Doug, if you help me, 10 years 10 and 25 years. And uh, we do plan to eventually own this array. The size of this array is 1.004 megawatts DC. It's a ground mount system designed so that Antioch will consume most, if not all, the electricity produced. The construction process is quick and quiet. It's about, it takes about three months to put this thing in. It's quiet, it's low maintenance operations. Antioch will have to um, maintain the vegetative growth, uh, but our developer will maintain the array for us. So why is it located on our south campus? Well, the most obvious reason is the proximity to our central plant. And if I may walk over here just to show that location. So we got this array tucked into the northeast corner of this 42 acres and the power will be run from here over to our central geo plant uh, transformer tie-in. So again, proximity saves cost, keeping the array tucked up in there. The uh, South Campus is the only really open space we have to put an array. We've considered our neighbors by, again, the proximity of the array being in the northeast corner. I think as Tamara said, it was 500, some 550 feet away from our residential uh, property lines, a um, few hundred feet from, from the Antioch School. <clears throat> We also responded to uh, our neighbors and concerns about the sycamore trees on Corey Street. So we adjusted the array 120 feet away, get out of that shadowing, and preserve those sycamore trees. So there will be a few trees, as Tamara mentioned, that will have to come down that mm -hmm. are closer to the Antioch School. But again, our partner SPNL is. Uh, uh, stepped up and said they're going to donate 100 trees and plant 100 trees on our campus next year. 
The position also accommodates what we're trying to do with the farm and our future plans for the farm. Many people have asked why this can't be put on our rooftops and parking lots. Well, it boils down to costs. One, uh, having a distributed system like that on rooftops and, and canopies over parking lots drives up to the cost to where it's just not affordable for the college. We wouldn't get the type of rate we're getting with this field mount array. Uh, our developer, SPNL, couldn't find an investment partner to fund the cost that, that doing rooftop and, and, and parking lot arrays would create. There's also not enough available rooftop space or parking lot space to put the uh, one megawatt array on. The other thing is it must be behind our meter. I mean, that's the whole point of this. It's behind the meter generation, feeding our campus, offsetting the use of that central plant. And what doesn't get used by the central plant, it's consumed by the, the, uh, op the rest of the operating equipment on the college. <clears throat> so again, uh, site plan modifications to address concerns. Uh, we move the rate to preserve sycamore trees. We're going to be creating natural paths throughout the uh, south campus so that our neighbors and community can still walk their dogs on south campus. Uh, there will still be plenty of green space uh, to do other activities. We've carved out even a play area for the Antioch School, um, almost an acre, that we'll preserve for the, for the children. Uh, the array field will be adjusted so that it does not interfere with the Herman Street right-of-way or sanitary easement, as Cameron mentioned. Um, and again, it's located away from residential. Other concerns that we've recently heard about is solar power might a competing public utility. <coughs> Ken, I don't know if you want to summarize um, the memo you got from your village solicitor on that point. Maybe we save that for later. Sure. Okay. Um, questions about will it impact our, our residential communities' rates? And there will be no rate increases due to us having a one megawatt array. It will not impact your rates whatsoever. Uh, our village revenue and con on contracts protected. Um, well, when Laura Curtis was village manager, she had coordinated associates do a study and make recommendations um, that basically carved out a 4% um, hot piece of the, the electrical pie for large commercial users to have behind the meter renewable generation and made adjustments to their power purchasing and contracts to accommodate that. We also have uh, the Energy Board endorsement uh, for this array. Lastly, the sinkholes. There are sinkholes that have been out there for years. We've had some recent developments, some larger hinkles develop, sinkholes develop in the swale. Um, Solar Power and Light um, recently had brought their engineers out on site and did some soils testing. They worked with our professor, Peter Townsend, our who is a, a geology expert, and they engineered a plan to ensure that when they mount the racking for the solar array that um, there won't be any type of collapse. Uh, they'll go down near the, near the same holes, they'll go down into bedrock to mount the uh, racking system. Or they'll span over it, but the guys from SPNO can give more details on that. And that's all I got. So, open it for questions. Okay. Um, Planning Commission. <coughs> any, any questions for Reggie? Yeah, I got one. Reggie. Thank you for that. Uh, how is the proposed array, uh, how is it compatible with the character of the general vicinity? Well, uh, in my view, it's compatible with. Uh, our village's vision, you know, the village made a decision um, to uh, looking forward, looking at their electrical portfolio, to go out and purchase renewable energy off, off the 
market. And in 2016, I understand 80% of that portfolio is going to be uh, from re renewable energy. So it certainly fits in with the village's vision and it's taken the village in a direction to uh, be carbon, you know, virtually carbon free. And our solar array is certainly going to, to add to that. But also, I mean, Antioch College has a history of having its own power plant. That plant you showed the picture, that was 1935 or something. Is that still, when did that go defunct, that power plant? That power plant was in operation until 2008 when the college closed. Okay, so in that sense, power generation on the college is compatible with, you know, 70, 80 years of usage it has been done on the college. That's true. I mean, it's a, do, do you have um, power generation to even cool our buildings? It's been there a long time, and, and this certainly replaces it in a, a, you know, a fossil fuel burning in a positive way. Thank you. Okay, I've got two questions for you, Reggie. Um, two weeks ago when you held the open house, let's say, I thought I heard the people that are constructing this saying that this power was to go into the grid. So it... It's going to go into the college electrical infrastructure, our grid. Um, there will be meters installed, two-way meters, to both measure demand and kilowatt hour uh, consumption. So they'll be looking at both what the array might do to demand, you know, and how much power at any given time the, the village has to serve the college with, but also if any of that, those, that kilowatt goes back on the grid if we don't consume it, it's net metered. Um, we would get a wholesale credit for any of that power that goes back on the grid. We don't want it to go on the village grid. We want to consume it all because we're paying a rate uh, to our provider, the owner of the array. Um, and getting the wholesale back, we're gonna you know, basically lose money for every kilowatt hour we put back on the village grid. So it, it's our complete intent to consume that energy on campus. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about, let's talk about the sinkholes. Um, do, do we have a copy of this, uh, of this report that you referred to, uh, this uh, GEO report? Or? Well, there's not a report. Um, Solar Power and Light met with um, uh, our geologists, they brought their engineers out on site just this past week to start studying that and coming up with a solution for the racking system um, so that we don't, you know, have part of the array field collapse due to a sinkhole. Right. That, so that's, that's, still, that's still being studied. And Brent, I don't know if you want to say any more about that. There actually is a study of Roughly 120-page study that was. You need to go to the microphone. Uh, yeah, up to the microphone, please. I am uh, Brett Boyd, Chief Operating Officer of uh, Solar Power and Light. There is actually a study that was performed by Professor Peter uh, some years ago that completely describes the nature and characteristics of sinkholes in the general area of where uh, the solar array will be constructed, as well as areas outside of that. Uh, we identified um, one major area of sinkhole that um, is right under where we plan to construct solar. And we also uh, understand and notice from his study that there are what we might call micro uh, sinkholes also in that same general area. And so from an engineering standpoint, we have three basic uh, remedies for that problem. In the area where the large visible sinkhole is today, and you actually can see it if you walk out to the property, we do not intend to put panels or racking uh, in that area. We're engineering around that, that large area with enough setback to protect ourselves from you know possible future uh, erosion. <coughs> in the areas of the uh, micro uh, 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 sinkhole areas, uh, we intend to span the gap of our racking to uh, go around that. So we intend to put panels there, but we'll develop and design the racking to go uh, beyond where the sinkholes are. There's also another condition that we've noticed with uh, soil testing out there, and that is our typical depth of inserting our uh, 
our engineered uh, helical anchors is to go in three feet. Well, there are also certain areas around the sinkholes where we only have two good feet of, of dirt, and under that is a uh, limestone bedrock. And so in those cases, we intend to drill into the bedrock to secure structurally our anchors. And so uh, we will continue to, uh, well, we intend to do a, a, a further, uh, what's called a geotech test in the area of the swell with a ground penetrating a sonar to make certain that there are no other issues in the general area of the sinkholes that we uh, may, may, or may, not have, may, may or may not have to address. So we fully understand the magnitude of the problem. In fact, it's not something we just learned about two weeks ago. We, we've known about this study for over a year. Um, it's just that we weren't intending to pour resources in until we were close enough to having a contract with the university to extend the resources to engineer uh, a solution to that problem. So it did not catch us by surprise. We've known about sinkholes in the area. It's just that from a timing standpoint, we are engineering a uh, solution to that problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, I have one in, in terms of the statics and looks and so forth. Um, from your picture there, uh, the uh, panels are facing south, and the residents on the Herman Street side, so they would be seeing the size and the structure that's holding the panels. Am I well, we did nothing to the surrounding terrain, but we do plan uh, both to enhance the aesthetics of the array using artwork, using gardens from our farm, whether it be uh, flower gardens or vegetable gardens, uh, but the array will uh, be beautified in that manner. And we've, we've engaged our art department on this. Um, they're really excited about doing projects on the fence, uh, again, to improve the aesthetics. And, and another question. How many openings within the, the chain link, the black chain link fence for each section will there be for you folks to get in and out for maintenance? I don't know. Grant, can you answer how many gates we'll have on each surrounding fence? And, and how will they be secured if there are gates? So the, uh, the fencing uh, is required by AEC code to be eight feet tall. Uh, there are two sections of uh, fence because of the public easement that goes through the array field. And so uh, there will be a, uh, a roughly a 10 to 12 foot gate opening in each of those sections that will be locked. There will also be signage uh, posted that says uh, that uh, no one should enter the gated area because of high electricity. Um, standard types of signage that you see on utility sites. So two access points, one in each section, um, that will be locked and accessible by uh, authorized personnel. Okay. And, and how will you uh, make sure that when they're in mowing and so forth, that they are locked? And, and the reason I asked the question, I, I did go out to the uh, Cedarville site. And, and one of their gates was unsecured, and I didn't see anybody around. Okay, so we put lock boxes on uh, every one of our fences, and I know the tendency for grounds maintenance crew is, you know, maybe they go away for lunch break, or maybe they uh, start today and finish tomorrow. So we, by uh, you know, matter of uh, procedure, we put lock boxes on all of our fences, so there's no reason to not have a key to open and close the gate lock it every time you enter and, and exit. So I don't think you're asking when they're inside cutting, it should be locked. You're saying when there's no when there's 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 no, no one's around and yeah. 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 So my crew is very responsible. They'll ensure that it's locked. We also have campus security and that'll become <coughs> part of their routine and we check the gates on the array and ensure that they're locked at all times. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well then, I guess we're at a point now where we're ready for the public hearing. So I'm going to open up this public hearing. Um, all those wishing to comment 
Uh, we're going to give you two minutes uh, to comment. Um, so uh, I guess, what's that? Make, make sure to state your name, please. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, our by what our bylaws <laughs> say is that you're going to state your name and your address. So we're going we're gonna to go with that. So uh, when you're recognized by the chair, yes, you will come up to the microphone um, and state your concerns. Okay, let's go. Okay, right here. The Lord go first. Oh, Lord. Or I have to wait. Okay, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I'm Laura Curlis, 110 Kurt Street, which is in that residential area around there. Um, the new zoning code allows solar facilities in an educational district. This, but let's be clear, this isn't an educational project. It is a project of an industrial scale to generate electricity. And it is also being done in the context of a village that has worked very hard and, and should be celebrated for all the green power contracts that has accumulated since the 1970s when it first bought into the Niagara Falls project, NIAP. So as of 2016, this village will be 84% green when you turn on the switch. And so any electricity, the college being in the village, would also be 84% green without doing anything. So that's a context in which this project's happening. And so an industrial scale project is being put on a prime land next to the Glen, surrounded by residences. That's unusual for an industrial scale project. And it's not usually in most places considered compatible. So these kind of projects would be put on industrial land or they'd be put in places that were more of an industrial character. I've done a 50 kW project for the city of Wilmington with ARA money. We tucked it in an industrial area near a wastewater treatment plant. We used it for the wastewater treatment plant. So this project, by the very fact they have to make room for a Herman Street right-of-way and a sanitary sewer, this whole area was designed for future residential de development. And so compatibility is hard to achieve. They've tried very hard indeed, but when that eight-foot chain link fence goes up, it's going to be very hard to make it not feel industrial and the whole, it will change the character of the area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next. I think I, think I selected this person right here. Okay. I'm Laura Ellison. I live at 120 Kirk Street, and then that property abuts the land that we're discussing. I graduated from Antioch College in 1989. And I'm a proud alumna, I'm an outspoken alumna, and I have dug deep in my heart and pockets to support the college as it's getting itself going again. I currently serve on the alumni board. I've lived in town for 20 years, and I, uh, my family was very involved in the passive solar movement in the 70s. So while I support solar power, I can't support this particular industrial installation on, on the uh, site that it is being proposed. Um, my home is the farthest south resident that is exposed to the panels with, that will be southern facing. Um, we've brought up issues of glare over and over again and I, I still have concerns about, about that particularly um, for residents farther south. Um, I, I have <coughs> concerns that this is not a community project, that it is not educational use, that it's commercial use when land is leased by a private energy source, and, it, and it's suspect to me when the project manager of that company sits on the energy board. Uh, the industrial installation, uh, such as it is, it, it is in no way in keeping with what currently exists. Um, current use, the current schemata, the current architecture of the college campus or the residents. Um, I, another concern I have is the obstruction of view for residents. The stormwater is, is and has been an ongoing problem on that property for years. It has never been properly addressed and I don't see how putting this will help that in any way. I worry that the fence will become a catch-all and the problem worse. 
sinkholes are a huge problem. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right here in front. Thank you. My name is Phil King. I'm at 1350 Rice Road. I spent 65 years on that property continually enjoying it, and I thank Antioch College for that. Son of alumni, great supporter of Antioch, and it feels rather odd to be on the other side of this particular issue. I think it's, a, it's an industrial installation in a verdant, green, almost nature place. I think no one's mentioned the Women's Park, but the Women's Park will be affected by the near proximity of that monstrous, huge installation. Also, I hear from the, the plans that it's going to be within 220 feet of the Antioch School. Did I hear that right? If it's 220 feet from the Antioch School, it's, it's a lot closer to the Antioch School parking lot and the land that the Antioch School uses often, which is just north of the, of the parking lot. I'm concerned about safety of the Antioch School kids. It's, if there's a, a fence, they'll climb the fence. If there's a sign, all, it's an invitation to violate what the sign says. Um, I'm concerned very much about the sinkhole problem. The very nature of sinkholes and micro sinkholes is that you don't know where they're going to come or when they're going to come. So the idea of building around the existing ones is kind of strikes me as a rather, a rather slight solution to the problem. I, I direct your attention to your members, uh, Matt Reed's letter, expressed uh, serious concerns about the sinkhole problem and the flooding problem as well. I guess I haven't heard the beat yet, but I guess I'm done. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, back here. Yes. Richard Lapidus, 130 West Lines. Uh, folks, I wanted to uh, read a statement that I think better and more briefly expresses what I have on my mind. Uh, sincere thanks to the open space thinkers for engaging the community in a deep and broad dialectic about how Antioch develops the land it owns between its campus, the Glen, and several village homes. This discussion has caused Maureen and I, as well as many others, to focus our minds on the issues. Our personal perspective is the strategic vitality and authenticity of our village, now and in the future. We're deeply committed to that end. Antioch College is directly or indirectly the reason many of us are here. It has long been the core institution of this place. Now its renewal is closely linked to developing a powerful pedagogy that engages the issues of the 21st, not the 20th century. Its renewal has the highest strategic value to us all. Fortunately, the land it owns next to its campus has emerged as a critical component of that renewal. Maureen and I see no other higher use for this land than what the college has proposed. Furthermore, we believe that doing nothing with this critical asset would be poor stewardship on the part of its board, administration, and faculty. And I would add to that one final comment, which is, it would certainly be possible for the college to build, uh, within allowances, a large building on that very site. And that would be a much greater interference with all the concerns that the few neighbors nearby may have about the fence and what is within it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Right here. Second row. My name is Ruth Lapp, and I live at 1340 President Street. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, we are a small village. We really want Antioch to succeed. However, I don't believe that this is the way to do it. I don't think putting a five-acre solar panel in the heart of the downtown is what Antioch has at its heart. And furthermore, it doesn't appear to conform to the uses of conditional use changes the character and sets the precedent, which I think has not been addressed yet, of allowing what is an industrial scale <coughs> project in what is basically a residential area. Yes, they can make, make a huge building, and that would be in character much more than five acres of solar panels. Um, it is dead, I think it is clashing with the natural treat area that we have. It's compatible with a residential park-like neighborhood. 
And I think the use of renewable energy is important and careful consideration must be given to where to locate it. It is important, we do need it, but that is not the place for it. And furthermore, the uh, installation on Palmer Road is not just next to a pre-existing residential neighborhood, but what appears to be a dump or some sort of place which is an industrial use. Thank you. Okay, now I saw some hands in the back there. Um, this gentleman over to the, to, the, to the side. Yes, you. Hi, um, my name is Eric Wolf. I live in 1031 and a half East High Road. And um, I just want to ask two rhetorical questions, if that's all right. And the first one is, in 20 years, when the history of this moment is written, what would you want someone to write about your role here tonight? How would you want to be remembered? Because I think we're talking about a pivotal moment in the history of the village. And the second question, rhetorical too, is how does this project, in its essence, represent or embody how the village is perceived all around Ohio? Because Yellow Springs has always been a place where we cut the edge, where we make the way. And to me, this is an example of that. And so I will hardly support, even though for the rest of my life, I will drive down Corey Street and see that eight foot fence. And I hope that you will find a fence that I can see through, because I'd like to see the solar array. <laughs> um, and the last thing I'd like to say is a little bit more um, real to me, which is that, and, and this may seem to those of you who think it's political, but it's not very real. We've been at war a long time, and in my opinion, and it's only my opinion, we've been at war about oil and about energy. And to me, this solar array is a minor inconvenience. But men and women are dying because of our wars. And if we have the solar array, this minor inconvenience, we may have one more step towards not having to have those wars anymore. And I'm not trying to pull political punches here, I'm just trying to say what I see as a truth. That Free, that, that independent energy in America means less wars. Thank you. No, 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 no let's not clap, please. <laughs> no, I have to not clap. <laughs> My name is Harvey Page, 1440 Meadow Lane in Yellow Springs. Um, I think the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I have a 3.45 kilowatt array in my backyard, a full mother array. I don't think it's ugly. I think it's beautiful. Uh, I think that the uh, discussion that we just had about uh, wars uh, is perhaps um, uh, less important than what we're doing to the environment, climate change. Uh, I think none of us can really deny that uh, we have some serious climate problems. Uh, I built my array, which has produced about 12 and a half megawatt hours of power in the 37, almost 38 months that it's been in action. Um, and I'm proud of it. Uh, I think it's beautiful. And I think that the panels that are uh, built along uh, uh, Quarry Street will also be thought of as something that we can all be proud of as a village. Also wanted to comment on the sinkholes. You know, I think that the village doesn't have to uh, be too concerned about what happens if one of those panels disappears. Uh, people are saying they don't want them. If they're just all That's a problem. I think that we should do everything in our power as a village to help Antioch. Uh, and I think this is, uh, if anything, I would suggest more, more solar panels, not fewer. Thank okay, you. thank you, thank you. Okay, right there and back. <coughs> My name is Bill Short. I live at 450 Allen Street, and I know Mr. Roosevelt says, oh no, here he goes again. I have to say that I will probably be facing, because I'm on the south end of it, so I'm going to see the, uh, what they're talking about, the uh, reflection. I really don't think it's going to be a problem whatsoever, and I applaud Antioch for going forward with this. 
I think it's a great move. I think it's something that more things should be done around the area like this. So I have an effect. I'm right directly facing them, and I have no objection to this whatsoever. So applaud you very much, Mr. Roosevelt. Thank you. Right, right there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is David Scott. I live at 321 South High Street. I'm also speaking for my sister who lives at 305 Allen Street and my mother at 319 Allen Street, right on the border of the, of the golf course. And we are uh, in complete support of this example of getting us off of a oil dependency and being independently uh, power ourselves. And I, I think we shouldn't see people that complain about seeing the solar array out their kitchen window. I want everybody to see a solar array out their kitchen window. Thank you. Okay, this gentleman over here. Yes, you. I'm Pat Murphy. I live at 1055 East Tide Road. Uh, when Reggie said uh, this may be the only campus in the country that's generating their heat and power system off of electricity. I thought, how phenomenal, 4,700 campuses, and we are going maybe to be the first. And I think that represents what uh, the village has been doing with energy for about 10 years. I was one of the early members of the energy board. We stopped a couple of power, coal power plants. Uh, we didn't put in a new distribution system. We did the, the, we did the roof of the building, so we've taken all these positions dealing with energy. But this began eight years ago, and that was before the most recent reports that came out last year and early this year on the seriousness of this climate change situation. The International Energy Agency is saying they don't see any way right now to hold the temperature raised to 1.5 degrees centigrade. The other ideas, of, such as carbon sequestration by pumping CO2 into the ground, are just not showing up. Many of these technical feasibilities that we've been betting on are not going to happen. The one thing is working right now is solar. And I think, see, the growth in solar is not simply because we like it, because we do not have a lot of other alternatives. So I see Antioch is taking a lead both for the village and also for education and actually for the state of Ohio, and ultimately for the United States. So I applaud them and support this. Thank you. Right here. Uh, I'm Hillary Pearson. I live at 1120 President Street, which is uh, directly adjacent to the golf course, um, the land being discussed. Um, it's difficult to stand up here as one resident of Yellow Springs. I'm also a direct neighbor, so what I say often is dismissed as NIMBY, but I'm also a resident of Yellow Springs, and I look out for the welfare of Yellow Springs. Um, and I look to you, I, I honestly do. I thank you for your service. I look to you and your expertise in this matter and turn to other experts to sort of decide not whether solar is a good idea. I think solar is a great idea. Um, it's a question of location. It's a question of is this a wise location for this, and does it fit within the plan of the village, the comprehensive vision that we have, does it fit within the zoning um, rules that are set there to protect the residents of Yellow Springs? Um, and not that, you know, an institution that we, we all want to succeed um, sort of has a, a blank slate. Um, so I'm currently against the current proposal for uh, a solar array of this magnitude, of this size and scope on this location. Thank you. Wait, there's somebody all the way in the back and right there. Hi. Um, I, I just want to say that I, I didn't actually come Your name? For this. My name is Shane Creeping Bear. I live at 402 North Park Place. Um, I've been here for almost uh, 13 years. So. But I just want to say that If the energy doesn't come from within, it comes from somewhere else. It's a great privilege to sweep it under the rug 
and pretend that it doesn't exist in other places. So you talk about the damage to our green space that's happening somewhere else. Um, and by um, not accepting that um, as a responsibility, you are actively in favor of destroying uh, land that you don't have to look at every day. Okay, thank you. Okay, two people over here, let's see. Right there. <coughs> uh, my name is Jerry Patton. I live at 214 East Whiteman Street. And uh, I've been a neighbor of the college for uh, 25 years. And um, some of you uh, may be aware that the previous administration, uh, their uh, stewardship wasn't anything to be too proud of, and I had to battle with them uh, many times. But uh, I've uh, found the current administration uh, a breath of fresh air, and I applaud their effort uh, in this uh, installation of the solar panels. Um, I believe it meets the codified ordinances of the village and uh, it's consistent with the values of the village and I think it's also consistent with the educational mission of the college. Uh, I also sit on the energy board. Uh, some of you may remember uh, in years past uh, the energy board of the village tried to uh, site a, a, a megawatt solar farm uh, out uh, on the uh, uh, western end of the village. Uh, so I believe that the installation of this uh, solar facility is consistent uh, with both the goals of the council, stated goals of the council and the energy board. And uh, one thing I'd like to add, uh, it was mentioned that uh, one of the energy board members uh, also uh, uh, as an employee of Solar Power and Light. And for the record, I'd like to uh, state that when the Energy Board was reaching any position on this matter, that uh, that member recluded himself from any of the discussions. Okay, thank you. Right there. My name is Chad Stiles, and uh, I live at 1425 Quarry Street. Um, I'm not a direct neighbor of the golf course, <clears throat> excuse me, but I've lived in Yellow Springs um, most of my 39 years, and I have enjoyed uh, the golf course just like Phil King said. Um, it is a space that is um, unlike any other, and we are so lucky to have had it. I, I don't know if it's past tense or present tense at this point, that's really up to to you, but I um, I see that space as having so much potential without being fenced <clears throat> off, without being parceled into different areas, without being codified into what it can provide in terms of power and energy. These are all good discussions and I appreciate everybody's comments, but that land to me has felt sacred for a long, long, long time. And if you read, I would point out, um, in Laura Ellison's letter here, I mean, even in the official document, the quick clean claim deed in June 26 of 1981, when the village took ownership of this land, um, for whatever reason, it was stated in there, using said premises for green space and recreation purposes of the general public and no other purpose whatsoever. No other purpose whatsoever. You know, it's. It's beautiful land that has been used as town commons for a long, long time, as long as I can remember, and I want my children now to be able to experience that same thing. Now, it doesn't mean I'm anti-solar. It doesn't mean that I don't see the environmental challenges. I would just incur, uh, encourage more discussion. I think there's way more discussion that needs to happen. I think that I mean, you can see there are a lot of people speaking out here that have some remiss about this. So we need to hear more. We need to keep talking. Okay, thank you. Right back there.
Hi, I'm Barb Collins Stratton. I'm not a direct neighbor. I reside at 577 West South College. I'd just like to make a couple of personal points as a community member who's lived here for about 25 years, raised four children, now raising a grandchild here. Um, I applaud Antioch College. I would ask the immediate neighbors whom I respect, and I understand some of the reservations that they've expressed, I would ask them to consider the global impact of the decisions that are being made here tonight. I would ask them to have, I won't say open their mind. I would ask them to just reconsider their position. I would also offer for consideration the fact that Glen Helen is a lovely, lovely green space afforded to this community by the generosity of Antioch College. And also ask that when you consider the ambiance of the neighborhood, that you get equal consideration to both members of that agreement because the college has the right to also be making changes to their property that fits their mission. They have every right to that. We have business owners who are residing in the residential area. They make certain demands. They make certain requests for accommodations. I ask that we give the college the same consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Right here. I'm an old lady, folks. It takes a little time. My name is Betty Ford, and I live at the corner of uh, 201 East Terminal Street and Livermore. I'm also concerned because my son owns the property right there at 1130 President Street. Plus, I manage Renee property on Herman Street. So I'm really involved with that location. And I've been in this village for 87 years. And I think it's great that Antioch could save $400,000 a year on their utilities. We would all love to do that. I also think solar is great. I just don't think it's in the right location. That's my concern. I think Antioch should put it someplace else. I also have a concern about the fencing. Not just the Antioch children, kids are curious and they will climb fences. So think about that. And they're right here in the neighborhood. Not just, they're gonna come from around all over Yellow Springs. So think about these young people that may climb the fences. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Right there. <coughs> My name is Stephen Rose Sr. and I live at 1016 Livermore Street. And I'd like to reiterate what's been said a couple of times, and that is the fact that this is this issue isn't about against Antioch, against solar right. That's not the issue. The issue is have our best and brightest minds looked at what we're talking about here? And have they given input to say, is there an alternative in terms of the location? Something that will satisfy everyone, not only the community. I keep hearing it. It has to be behind our, uh, our on our grid, on, on our side of the grid. Is there no other assets owned by Antioch that they could put the solar array there that would give the give them the credit for the energy that they're going to produce from their solar array? Has that question even been uh, looked at? The other thing I'd like to say is, from the perspective of the Planning Commission, what I would request of you is to do your own independent study. Provide an alternative for Antioch. Something that appeals to the community and that will satisfy what their energy needs are. Thank you. Thank you. Right there. Hi, I'm Dan Rudolph, 3590 Grinnell Road. I'm also a mem member of the Energy Board and I'm speaking in support of the solar array. Um, there's been a lot of comments of why don't they put it someplace else or why 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 does it have to be right there? And I live down on Grinnell Road. I would be happy to see a solar array across the street from my house to supply Antioch power, but it can't be done. It is not financially viable to do that. If they put it on the roofs of the buildings of the college, there aren't enough open south-facing roofs. They have to cut down a lot of trees, 
and they'd have to reinforce the roofs to be able to put the solar panels on those roofs. Parking lot structures cost too much money to make this project viable. Essentially, the only place that it could go was on the golf course in order to make it viable. And Antioch did the best job that I can see them doing in putting it in a place that has the minimal impact on everyone else. The Energy Board was involved in creating a policy that allowed solar, industrial solar and residential solar, and supported that um, as, as our guidelines. And unanimous, unanimously, we support the, uh, the Antioch Solar Array. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got this gentleman here in the, in the second row. Well, I've been a resident of Yellow Springs for 80 years. Uh, I've seen a lot of projects come and go. Your name? Robert Baldwin. I live on Allen Street, 302. You can't see the house. It's behind a bunch of shrubs. Uh, Antioch, of course, everyone understands this to be, it's a laudable goal with this renewable energy. And it's a gutsy decision that they made. My big concern is only three ways. Uh, I followed solar energy, not as closely as I should have. It sort of exploded on us after the farm, and after the budget, and all these things coming on in, in this very vital village. I don't think enough homework has been Done. I think Mr. Rowe hit it right on the head. Uh, number one, I the transmission doesn't bother me. I mean, hell, we get our power from the Ohio River. So the installation does not have to be where it is. Now, if it turns out there are no alternatives, you've got to have 4.5 acres to pull this project off. And it's a laudable project, but I there are too many damn questions around. I don't even know this solar company that's going to do it. I do know at one time Yellow Springs was going to do a solar array on the fall property. I don't know what happened to that. I do know there have been other projects in a 50 mile radius that were talked about. They never got off the ground. I don't know anything about this company. I don't know what their capitalization is. I don't know how long they've been in business. I do know. Uh, that the present administration has pushed hard and put millions into solar uh, funding plants to make the panels and get it done, and it was all for naught. It did not work. I do know Germany has always valued it, but they said, no, they can't do it. So you need it, but until you really figure out some of these things, you can put the thing on Bud Marsh's property. I'll get 20 seconds of something else. My goal is. The Vernet land is beautiful. It's sitting there. Thank, thank you, Bob. I would love to see our array there. Right. I'll do anything in my part to convince yeah. them. Thank you. Let's put it there. Thank you, Bob. There you go. Uh, this gentleman here in the second row. Good evening. My name is Ryan Pearson. I live at 1120 President Street. Uh, I like to remind all of us that uh, we live in a very complicated world and it's possible to have opposing truths and one of our nation's pastimes uh, is to uh, create a schism and look askance at each other across that schism and say things like if you're not with us you're against us if you aren't for this you're not for us and this is a very complicated issue and i wish you the best of luck i hope you're struggling with it because <laughs> Because despite the, the moral imperatives and uh, all the other concerns that are real and present, you also actually have legislation and ordinances that you have to follow. And your ears have to be tuned to those things. So I, I ask that as you consider uh, the fence, which to, for the single perimeter of 4.7 acres, which this is not, this is bifurcated, would be over one half a mile long at eight feet tall. If that has to happen for safety and it has to be there, please do not give my neighbor unmitigated power to unleash its talented, ambitious, trying to make portfolio art students <laughs> <laughs> to create whatever they want on that blank check. 
I, I encourage you, get the details of any plan that's proposed tonight. Um, no ideas, no maybes, no we coulds, no renderings. There are too many reasons why if things fail, all that will fall through the cracks. And, there's, and there is a reason that asking forgiveness is uh, easier than asking permission, right? Because accountability is tough. So I encourage you to get the information that the village staff has recommended. I encourage you to seek uh, the geological report because an internal report isn't one until you see it. Thank you. Thank you. Right here in front. My name is Lauren Miller. I live at 1117 Livermore Street. I'm a little bit of land away from this area in question. One that <coughs> separates our property and the golf course area that we're talking about. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity for allowing so many different viewpoints to be heard tonight. Obviously, there's many different considerations that many of us um, have thought long and hard on. And I want to go on record, of course, supporting Antioch College. And um, this is not about whether we do or do not support Antioch College in terms of the people that disagree with this project. It's about whether this project makes sense and whether this project, in the way that it's currently planned, fits with the standards and the conditions that you all are having to measure by. The way that I read the comprehensive plan said that the village government was supposed to be the supplier of water, sewage, and electricity. And that this would clearly be an installation of, of a com commercial size. The other concern I have about that is my understanding is that if Antioch College is allowed to provide, to uh, partner with uh, solar power and light, it's going to allow only 5% of solar um, abilities for any other company that comes into our community or a community that exists currently to pursue solar arrays or solar energy. And that's limiting diversity. It's also limiting um, uh, perhaps economic development. I'm not sure, but it is of a concern. I think that there's also a serious issue of the resource of land. People talk about the resource of water, solar, whatever, but there's an important resource of land and this golf course is it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, back here in the back here. Paul Lavendroth on Rice Road. I'm a retired engineer, so I read the report that the contractor prepared for you. It's in the uh, in your paperwork. There was one area that hasn't been discussed tonight and you have to address, and that's noise level. One of the previous speakers sued the Antioch University, I guess, over the sound of an air conditioner. <clears throat> this solar array will have dozens of power boxes with, according to the report, sound level comparable to an air conditioner. Mm. I think you should consider the amount of sound of all of these units in symphony uh, in their location. By the way, I have 10 solar panels, one on my sailboat and nine on my house. So. Thank you. Hello, my name is Craig Nesher, live at 322 Allen Street. Um, my main concern is, is for the project itself is the economic impact that it's going to have. I'm not sure how that affects with the planning board directly, but the, the, the questions of how the power is going to be dealt with, you know, it's going to be a private entity and a private benefit. It's not going to be a village benefit directly. Um, I think that more of an established uh, relationship between the village and the college in this particular perspective needs to be established before a decision is made. Because the, the excess power, if there is any, has got to go somewhere. 
and it's going to cost somebody something. And, I, and I'm afraid that it's going to cost the village indirectly in the long run, for which this is a, a village issue. It's not a, you know, a negative issue towards Antioch. But because we have this, <laughs> all the, the zoning codes that we spent a long time to establish, we got to be uniform with the process. And I, and I think that's an aspect that hasn't really been dealt with. We've dealt with the physicality, the aesthetics, which I feel also should be more uniform in the plan, not just, like you said, sort of an artistic rendition. But it has to be at least consistent so that if the array is, is agreed upon, the look will be complementary as much as possible. You know, it just can't be just sort of thrown up there, here it is. So that's, as long as the, the Planning Commission can address those issues, I'll be supportive of whatever the decision is, whether they, the, the panel stay or the panel don't stay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, are we done? <laughs> Uh, go ahead, Reggie. I just, in, in response, and I don't know if you want to chime in, but um, I don't know if any of you have been out to the Cedarville Array and been near the, the transformers of their array. They've got several large transformers on the back side of the array field. I was standing maybe 100 feet from the closest one. Couldn't hear a thing. So they are very quiet and operational. Brent would support that. Sure. So what I would say to summarize that is, you know, there's been a lot of opinions as to the technical operations of things. And, you know, Reggie hit it, hit it on the head with one of those issues in that sound level. You know, the, the inverters do have a certain decibel uh, specification and not certain if they're louder than an air conditioner or not, but uh, there is fact to each of the technical points that the uh, citizens has uh, made. <coughs> some were some were accurate and some were not accurate. So, you know, from a from a uh, zoning board standpoint, I think that what we what we're concerned with is that we are answering and meeting all of the uh, codified aspects of the code and uh, taking into consideration other sort of soft factors or subjective factors the best we can but uh, you know our goal here is to design a system that will meet the uh, requirements of uh, Antioch College uh, and stay within uh, the code of the zoning board the National Electric Code Board and Green County and, and other what we call authorities having jurisdiction in terms of what we have to do to make certain that we have a safe facility for the community and kids alike. I can also say that uh, about 49 seconds that there we have we personally own a lot a number of sites around uh, the state one being at the site of, of a church in Cincinnati where kids are running around every week uh, and so no one's tried to climb the fence yet you know a lot of questions we actually have taken one of the local school school districts inside the fence for um, educational purposes certainly we didn't let them go in certain areas where we didn't want them to go but, but certainly you know, there are a lot of perils in a city that uh, kids maneuver and, you know, make good and bad decisions on. And so this is another um, facility that will certainly uh, have dangers. And, and uh, you know, some kids are going to do crazy things just like, you know, kids do what they do in terms of, you know, putting their hands in there and what have that, or what have you. So um, certainly appreciate the comments. And so uh, we're happy to answer specific questions on actual facts of the technology. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Because I'm ready to close this public hearing. Point of information, no question. You just say that Middlebury College is energy self-sufficient, so NAC wouldn't be the first to do okay. second. Okay. Thank you. Okay. If there are no other comments to be made, I'm closing this public hearing. Hold on, wait a second. Have you spoken before, please? Okay, come forward. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sandy King, and I just wanted to stand in um, support of any at college doing this project in whatever way it works out the best. But I want to see 
solar array go up in this town, and I would have liked to have seen the village start this process and finish it um, with a solar array. But to see that Antioch College is taking this initiative and doing that, um, I think sets the example for the village. We need to be doing this. Um, there's always, it seems like, when there's a new idea and we're entrenched in something that we're accustomed to, there's always resistance to that idea. Well, oh, it's going to be too noisy, or it's going to be too much of this, too much of that. Well, I think what's too noisy to me is having the top of a mountain blown up and blown off in order to have the coal necessary for us to run the electronics and, and the things that we want in this modern life. And I think it's time that we stand up for our village and stand up for Mother Earth and uh, and support this this action by you. Thank okay, you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, folks, can I close it now? Mm -hmm. yep. All right, I'm going to close this public hearing. <coughs> Now, now we're going to go, yeah. now we're scheduled for the deliberation phase. Now, folks, it's 8.35. And um, we've got two more conditional uses to go through. And it's my recommendation that we table this matter for another meeting. Another meeting can be in two weeks. It could be our next regular scheduled meeting. That's up to the planning commission. But that's my suggestion. So what do you folks think? Bill. Well certainly there are there are lots there are lots of things to think about. Uh, things because it is something that we're doing for the future. We're we're looking at something that is probably going to be there for twenty five years. Uh, so it's a, it's a long-term commitment. The, the goals of the college, what they're trying to achieve, are really applaudable. There are uh, potential problems, uh, certainly uh, Matt brought them out in terms of the uh, underpinning limestone. Uh, and I would, I would like to see the report that, that uh, was generated by uh, 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 the, oh, Peter Townsend, I believe, uh, dealing with the issue. The sinkholes have been there a long time, and interestingly enough, I don't think they've grown much, uh, although I can't say that for sure. Um, and uh, the, the Two weeks ago, we had a, a probably once every 50 year rainstorm here, and everybody uh, is concerned about that. Uh, on the other hand, you know, there are, there are things for us to think about before we really act on the subject. Okay, Tim. Uh, yeah, I agree. I don't want to change the subject, so it'd be more time less of my research. Okay, Jerry. Uh, I probably will not be at your next meeting, given that I'm the alternate. But if, if you would let me, uh, I did go out and, I, and uh, actually go out to Cedar. I did go out to the Cedarville uh, operations, and and I went out there with the intent of addressing and seeing if I could address some of the issues that the folks I had. Uh, the issue of glare, I think I went out there and it was the brightest day ever. The sky was clear blue and the sun was bright and there was no glare and their facility is twice as large as the one that's being proposed in here. The second thing I looked at is aesthetics. So I stood on the ground at the south end and all I could see was one row of panels because all the panels were the same height and they were all tilted in the same direction. There was a hill that I could have climbed up, but I'm saying that hill was fenced off. So then I also looked at the groundwork uh, underneath of the panels. They had clover growing underneath of all the panels. And at that particular time, 
it was a nice green and red. So it, it looked pretty. I looked for security. I did find a fence, that a gate that was open, but I went inside and I looked around. I could not, and I'm not an electrical person, but I could not see anything that could harm me because it appeared that everything ran underground. So the final thing I did, they, they did have a fence and it was a house less than eight feet from the fence. So I knocked on the door. The homeowner came out and I told him who I was. And I said, what do you think about living next door to an electric field? Uh, he said, hey, I've got two kids. I moved here from out of state. I was very concerned about those aspects of it. So I did a lot of research and I found that it was probably safer than living next to the normal electrical plants. He has three young children and he said that it's my responsibility to make sure that when my children are out there playing and I'm out there with them so they won't plant the fence. The final thing that I looked at was noise. I asked him about the noise, plus I circled the whole plant. Until he told me about a humming sound, I heard nothing. When he identified the humming sound, then and I heard it, but it was, put this way, my car was louder than the humming sound that was coming from the generation and so forth. But I, I just want to, to, to say those things, because I can say I'm the alternate, but I feel whenever you're looking into a big project and one of a council person, you have to go out and do your research. And I did my research and I was comfortable with what I found. Very good, very good. Hey, Chris? John, I'm not opposed to tabling the discussion. Uh, we've got two other right. two other matters on our, uh, on our agenda. I do uh, just want to say, I counted 24 people that, that talked tonight. And my scorecard said, 11 were for it, 10 were against it, and three wanted more details. And the one detail that, uh, that I want to know more about is, is the noise issue that Mr. Abendroth brought up, if we could get some specifications. So my concern, if, if we table it, I want to make sure that Mr. Boyd, the engineer, can be back here again. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Okay, I believe you actually do have the specs on the noise level. All right. Okay, good, thank you. And finally, my concern about, about this was that it wasn't uh, compatible with the character of the general vicinity. However, uh, in light of the fact that there's been a power generation plant there for 80 some years, I do find this use consistent with, uh, with the character of the general vicinity, that there's been a power plant there for 80 years. Certainly this is going to be a different type of uh, power generation, but uh, it, it's consistent with uh, past usage for over eight decades. Okay, okay. <coughs> Do we need a motion to table this? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and you want to make sure you don't close the hearing. Just keep the hearing open. I close the hearing. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, you want to keep the. Do we need to open the hearing back again? Well, you closed it, I mean, but there may be a. We can, well, yeah, yeah, but we, can we've, we've, met our, we, we've met our legal obligations. Yes, you have. We do this again, we can do the same format, but we've met our legal obligation. Yes. Okay. Chris, Chris, don't they have to make sure that they address the, the approval or denial or conditional use within 30 days of the application? So if they okay. table it, unless the applicant asks for a continuance? Right. Okay. Isn't there something like well, I, that? I think you're going to talk about it that date to reschedule. Exactly. Exactly. I, 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 okay, I'm for one for the 23rd. That is that is two weeks from today in this room. You can't get 10 days. Well, hold on. <coughs> well, if it's tabled, you don't have to. I don't. We, yeah. Well, and you'll get it anyway as long as it's not a specific. <clears throat> okay, so the 23rd seems like it's fine. Okay, to the 23rd, the 3rd, 7 o'clock here, this room, 
to deliberate. <coughs> I think what we're going to do is, uh, although I won't be the chair, at least I don't think I'll be the chair at that time, we'll, we'll, um, we'll invite the public to comment uh, when we come back. Um, okay? So, I guess we, now we do need a, a motion. I'll make a motion that we table the discussion until uh, June 23rd at a special meeting of the Planning Commission to, uh, to further discuss and decide the issue. I second. Okay. All in favor say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the next thing on our agenda. Five minute break. Five minute break, folks. Okay. Break is five minutes. Next time. Okay, we're ready to go. Okay, guys, we're ready to go. <laughs> okay, now we have another conditional use application here, and this is the, uh, the brewing company at, um, at 305 North Walnut Street. Okay, so Tamara, we're going to go through the same process again. Um, you go ahead and give us the staff report. All right, this is a conditional use request. Um, it's, the applicant is William Creeping Beer. This goes by Shane. And the, this is a conditional use for a. Um, can, can, can we shut the door, please? Can't. Uh, can. For Vitruvian Brewing Company, and they're being represented by William Cricking Bear, and it's a request for a conditional use permit to allow a, a permitted tasting room and a permitted brewery. And the permitted brewery again is Vitruvian Brewing Company. They're located at 305 North Walnut Street in Sweet C, and uh, as you know, that's the Millworks Development Corporation. It's located within an L1 mixed industrial district. Um, the site itself is a three acre parcel owned by the Forest Valley. It contains an industrial complex with multiple tenants. Suite C is occupied by the Trubian Brewing Company and contains 39.95 square feet for their operation. The Millworks complex is also home to the Yellow Spring Brewery and the SG Artisan Distillery both contain tasting rooms. The applicant is requesting a conditional use permit to incorporate a limited amount of retail use to the Vitruvian Brewing Company business which occupies Suite C. The plans show that the main floor has 3,665 square feet of floor area plus a mezzanine area that provides an additional 330 square feet for a total floor area of 3,995 square feet. The tasting room used for retail sales would be limited to 1,198.5 square feet. And the plans, um, and this is because the, the regulation allows for a 30% to be used in retail sales. Plans do not identify whether the mezzanine level would be used for the tasting room, but it is um, limited to only eight people by the building regulations department. The main floor is limited to 44 people. The area shown with tables and stools appears to be less than 1,300 square feet, which would fall within the 30% allowed for retail sales. Parking spaces will be provided along the south property line next to the spaces provided by the Yellow Springs Brewery. The regulations are not clear on the calculation required for this type of establishment in our zoning code. And 
I show that. Um, what, uh, we'll get to that here a little bit. The I-1 mixed industrial district is intended to provide dedicated locations within the community for office research, knowledge-based industry services, light manufacturing and related uses that offer employment opportunities and create economic vitality for the village and its residents. Under accessory uses, it allows retail incidental to the manufacture or production of goods on the premise not ex not exceeding 30% of the total floor area of the principal building. The table for um, section 1264.02 has a parking requirements by use. And this is the part that I had mentioned was not very clear in our zoning code. Under the parking requirements by use, it identifies that for industrial uses, industrial establishments, including manufacturing, research, and testing <coughs> laboratories, creameries, bottling works, printing, plumbing, or electrical workshops would be required to provide one parking space for every 1.5 employees or 550 square feet of gross floor area, whichever is greater. In this case, that would require 16 parking spaces for the industrial use, or for, for the brewery use. The retail use under the parking re requirements states that the retail stores, except as otherwise specified herein, would require one parking space for over 250 square feet of usable floor area. And uh, since uh, that would be a, their <coughs> approximate usable floor area, by my calculations, would be about 1,300 square feet because the usable floor area would exclude storage areas, restrooms, hallways, um, the, the brewery use itself, it would just include the areas where we would have residential or have the, the public use. And by that calculation, I would think that they would require five parking spaces. If you looked at this as a restaurant, a bar, or a club, then private clubs, lodge halls, and banquet halls would require one parking <coughs> space for every three persons allowed within the maximum occupancy load as established by the village fire and building codes. The maximum occupancy load is 49 plus 8, so they have 57 people, and that would require 19 parking spaces. If you looked at this as a bar or a lounge or a tavern or a nightclub where the majority of the sales consist of alcoholic beverage, then they would be required to provide one parking space for every 50 square feet of usable floor area, which would be 26 parking spaces. The code actually does not give a very clear idea of what parking would be required for something like this because they are not, you know, the majority of their sales are not consistent on selling to the public the alcoholic beverages. And so then under definitions, I, I gave you a couple definitions for gross floor area and usable floor area since they were referred to in the parking um, requirements. I don't think I need to read those, I've explained those already. And again, you have the same conditional uh, use requirements as we discussed earlier. Um, if you'd like me to reread this, I can. No. <laughs> the, um, okay, the um, staff recommendation is that the Planning Commission discuss the application and approve the conditional use for the tasting room conditional on the parking to be resolved. Okay, any questions for Pamela? I think it'd be for Tamara. What formula do we use for parking for the uh, the brandy tasting room? Do you recall it? Well, we had a different uh, zoning code at that time, so now we have this zoning code. And I did bring the other one, but I, did, I wouldn't really have to, have to calculate it all out. Okay, that's fine. Okay. So, Tamara, you, you're saying that we have to decide against uh, rule number one, two, three? Well, those were just some examples that I gave. None of those really talk about what a tasting room would require. Also, if you'll notice in the zoning code, um, they would actually, a brewery uh, or a brew pub would also be a conditional use in an industrial district. So you know, they, they really could do more than a tasting room, but a tasting room to me sounds like it would be less than what a brew pub would be, or, um, you know, or less than what a restaurant would be. Um, I think it's excessive to ask, you know, for 26 parking spaces plus 16 for the, the 
brewery use itself. And you know, if you look at the 19 plus the 16, I just think that you know when you start adding these numbers up, it becomes more excessive than what was required for the other breweries. But I'm not sure what the solution is for the parking. I guess my other one, I and mean, you probably never took that into consideration, we assume that the parking lots were paid. So I went out and looked at Mrs. Stone, so yes. I had no way of trying yes. to calculate how many parking spaces were yes. out there. So. I did ask um, the Hoovers to be present today, since it is, the, you know, it is their um, business. <coughs> Maybe they could give some details on that to you also. We're going we're gonna to basically, um, if there's no other questions from camera, we're going to go into our public hearing. You want Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Please. Um, the applicant, you want to uh, give us a brief overview of your request? Uh, do you want to do this? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm the wife. I'm Jackie. I am Eco Kitchen consider me the secondary applicant. Um, the co-owner, I don't know how you, yeah, we work together on things. Either way, uh, there are just a couple <coughs> of clarifications that I'd like to make. The maximum occupancy is declared at 49 people with building code and regulations. The mezzanine is not a place for any public people to be. So maximum <coughs> occupancy is declared at 49 people solid. So it's not 57, um, so if you're going to require parking spaces on maximum <coughs> occupancy, 49 people maximum. Um, if you want to do it according to how many employees, currently there are only two. Um, and so that's simple enough. Another thing is I believe our building plans were provided in um, everybody's notes. You can subtract about 300 square feet for the mezzanine and then another 300 square feet for our um, storefront location where we don't intend for any seating or conjugation of people, like actual like public people sitting down at the storefront. It'll be aisles with t-shirts and supplies and things of this sort, that's another 300 square feet. And so if you want to look at square footage according to, you know, to compare square footage according to how many parking spaces we need, you can subtract another, it's 292 <coughs> square feet on that spot. So you're looking at reducing it to almost 685 square feet to how many, how many to compare square footage to how many parking spaces. So it's a drastic reduction from the 1,300. And I know you didn't. No, no the plants didn't identify Yeah, no, it. he didn't identify it at all in the plants. Like a lot of that, uh, if there were, I could show you. Um, I, what I had to go by was the plan that you all should have a couple of this right. small plan. Right. Basically, this area where he has the seating area, that's not a seat. That's not intended to be a seating area at all. Right there. So that corner is going to be blocked off. And then the mezzanine, which exists right here, would be this square footage would also be deleted from mm -hmm. the. We don't. Um, intend for there to be a whole lot of people there at one time. Like I said, maximum occupancy is guaranteed at 49. Otherwise, we're risking our our licenses with building regulation, Green County, and all of that, um, which is pretty a little bit important. Um, and so if you want to go, so those are just some, some figures to try to understand exactly how many people we intend to have on premises at any one given time. <laughs> we have outlined that we have space for, what did we outline, like nine parking spaces? 
I mean, Millworks has a decent parking lot, and um, we've been, you know, in contact with the landowners, and it's possible to delineate parking spaces without paving anything. We could put up parking curbs. Um, you know, there are ways around that issue where we can delineate exactly how many parking spaces are there. But really, there's a huge parking lot. There's a lot of space for everybody. I, and most of the space that is there is already delineated for office spaces that are operating from nine to five when we don't intend to, we intend to operate from like six to 10. So it's a, it's a usage thing. It's when are we gonna be here? Can we accommodate everyone? And we feel like there's just no reason that we couldn't. So I see you're saying your store hours would be open from six to 10? Six to 10, six to midnight. We're not gonna open before five. It's gonna be an evening thing that- Do we remember what we post on a jury? I believe that they're similar. I know that the Kelly Company and that um, EnviroFlight are opposite, and those are the other two major uses of the space. Yeah, maybe, maybe Sam knows. Sam, do you do you know the hours of the brewery? I it was you, you better tell me the question. Okay. What the hours of the brewery? Hours of operation of the, of. Oh, I know what the hours are. I was trying to think of what uh, limitations have been imposed. Those are different issues. Yeah. Uh, I think they open now about three o'clock and go till seven through the week, and and they're extended a little bit on uh, Saturday and restricted some on Sunday. Um, but I think, and you'd have to check the record to be sure. I think that you gave them the freedom to change their hours between one and midnight or some yeah. such thing. Okay. Okay. So <coughs> my only point is that the other major uses of the parking spaces operate on opposite hours that we do. Enviroflight <coughs> and the Kelly Company are on the opposite hours. They're not in fibers. And the other brewery and the, uh, and the distillery are on the later hours. Okay. Any more questions for her? Okay. I was thinking that the hours of operation through the week were uh, up until 10 and then weekends was until midnight, but I could be wrong. That's why I remember she just made it. I think they wouldn't be that good. Right, they don't, they, they, they won't use, they don't they're not them. using them all. Right. I'm just talking about what the conditions they capped it at, not that they do. Good point. <clears throat> okay. okay. Let's let's uh, let's go ahead and open up our public hearing. Uh, anybody have any concerns regarding this application? Sam. Your name. I'm Sam Young. I'm one of the principal owners of Norwood Development Corporation. Um, we are aware of the need for the handicap parking uh, for Shane and Jackie. <coughs> we have a paved area that we think can be adapted to that very easily. As far as additional parking beyond that, um, I don't know. If you give me a number, I can probably tell you <laughs> whether or not we meet it. Short of that, I think Millworks has plenty of parking. I don't think it's a problem or an issue. Okay. The zoning code does allow for shared parking. Okay, okay. Richard Lapidus, 130 West Limestone. I am a sub tenant of one of the buildings in that area with the millworks, and I use my faci the facility as an individual one. It's a studio use for me alone, and I use it. At throughout the day and sometimes in the early evening and it can be on very busy occasions and there has never been 
inadequate parking in that lot ever in the many years I've been using the facility, during which time lots of new business has filled up, and much of it is retail, and therefore pretty high traffic at times. I've never been constrained in any way. <coughs> so I think of this as being a straightforward thing from my perspective as a co-user of the space. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Tell the truth, Richard, you walk to work. <laughs> <laughs> I walk to work. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, anything else? Okay, we're close to public hearing. Oh, uh, oh, my two cents in a Come, Come forward. I can't speak. My name's Isaac Delmater. I live across the street from the site at uh, 218 North Walnut. I can speak as a chef uh, from a cultural and economic standpoint. Uh, these kinds of projects are very beneficial to the area. Uh, it lends a certain amount of flavor and uh, kind of expresses uh, our culture and entrepreneurial spirit. So, I'm all for it. Very good. Very good. Okay. <laughs> Definitely lends flavor. <laughs> I thought that. In my experience, uh, the more of a certain type of establishment you have in one place, the Name. better. Oh, Eric Wolf, 1031 East High Road. The more you have of a certain, you know, the drinking establishments being in one location, the brewery so close is really good because the customers from the brewery might be interested in tasting room and the I just think it's a, it's a good thing. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're ready to close this. Okay, okay, it's closed. <coughs> okay, you guys. Um, yeah, it's parking. So. What are we going to do? We, I, I, you know, I, I suppose, um, uh, you know, we, we need to know what category to put them in. And I, I think one of the things that we can probably do with these guys, I mean, they, they have to provide the, the handicap, the paid candy, ha handicap parking. <coughs> I, you know, it's my idea, you know, you, yeah, if, if, if they just put, curb bumpers in, whatever you call those right. things. Um, that's a relatively inexpensive way, and they're not really getting harmed by, um, you know, some of these numbers, if, if that's what we ask. <coughs> um, if you've seen that place on the weekend, man, I'll tell you what, there are cars all over the place. So I, I, I think a little bit of orderly parking would be helpful. Um, so. What category do you think they fall into? <coughs> There's another alternative. John, go for it. We look forward to this. <laughs> up, up to the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> John Eastman. Uh, it just occurred to me that, I mean, one way is to try to put them into a category, and <coughs> the other is to really just consider the whole space and the use of it, and in your judgment, you think that there's going to be adequate parking for the people that are going to be using the space and not worry about putting it into a category. Just You're, you're making a judgment call no matter what you're doing, so can you just declare that the mixed use of facilities there is going to be adequately served and be done with it? Okay, camera. <clears throat> Did you say can? Yeah, can we? Yeah. I'm more comfortable putting it in, in a category because we're, we're going to have this again and again and again. And if this doesn't work, then we can work on changing it to be more specific. Um, I'm more comfortable sticking them in a, in, a, in a category. Just as a side note, um, um, if, you know, Millworks is at capacity. There are no other tenants to be moved in. There is nothing else to put on the table. There are no other issues to be resolved. Like once we are moved in or approved of, that's that. Okay. Do you, you, you mean You mean once you go in, there will be no other demands on parking? No, that's what I'm saying. Like Millworks is at capacity. All of their spaces have been filled, and so there will be no one else that is like, oh, I need to change a conditional use for something. It, it won't happen because everybody, all of the space will be used. Everything will be occupied. Sam, you, Sam, you buy that? <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Sam Young. Um, what Jackie says is generally true. There are a couple of small spaces that have never been improved that may someday be improved. Um, if so, they might add a couple of employees, but um, it wouldn't change the basic thrust of what Jackie says. Okay. Can I? Yeah, Jerry, go for it. If, 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 if I'm taking the definition of a tasting room, is then we get me to buy maybe in quantity and leave, then I would interpret that retail sales, and then I would go with the, the retail sales. But looking as a whole at, at all three, I would then look at to be the least intrusive on the business, and I could also go with uh, residential five spaces. Retail use. Retail. Retail use. Well, that might, that might be right. Are we going to go with the 1,300 square foot that Tamara estimated or the 685 that the uh, applicant just suggested? Well, was. the applicant's, I think the applicant's suggestion is credible, correct? Or if you're looking at the, 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 the options that use square footage of usable floor area, the first one is actually for the industrial establishment, for the brewery. And the brewery, even though they only have two employees, it says whichever is greater. And that may have been, you know, a mistake, I don't know. But they have 500, you know, for every 550 square feet of gross floor area. And I really was unable really to tell what the gross floor area was or the useful floor area because it's really not spelled out. On here, so you know, I was just sort of trying to calculate what they have here. Um, and gross—that's why I put the definitions there. Gross floor area is a little defined a little differently. It seems excessive to me to require you know 16 parking spaces when you have two employees. And I'm not sure how that came about. That uh, that item. So we're going to go with 685 or 1300. I mean, the 685 is incredible. 685. Yeah. 685. Okay. Now, so if, 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 if we put it under retail, what, what is that, about two and a half spaces? You need more than that. So the other, the other, I don't think industrial use fits. Well, the, yeah, the brewery is a, a, the brewery itself is the industrial use. Right. Because that's, for, that's the manufacturing, um, that's what they're doing. So if it's a tasting room, it's a bar. It is sort of, but it's not, it doesn't really fit in as a restaurant, a bar, or a club. Well, what, is, what, what do y'all think about 13 parking spaces? Is that, is that out? And I'm going to kind of ask the applicant and uh, Mr. Young, is 13, is that? Yeah, and I think, I think, I, I think I, I, that, that, that really ought to fly. It's a bar, 685 is our number, 13 would be the parking spaces. We would require one handicap spot plus uh, 12 curves. Does that make sense in that parking lot? This curb notion? Are you talking in addition to what the ALG brewery and the SFG? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all, all, all Sam's got to do is go out there and pull those out of his pickup truck, put them down, drive a couple <laughs> pieces of rebar down, and it's done. Okay. Go ahead, Sam. Um, <clears throat> You asked several questions and I'm not sure which one to answer first. I think that the requirement for one handicapped place and 12 parking places uh, is easily met. There's more than that available. Um, if you're talking about uh, um, specifying another number for the brewery, which as far as I know didn't have a number specified and doesn't have buffer blocks, um, Then I guess I, I begin to ask questions about what's going to happen to the whole parking lot. We currently do not have any assigned spaces, and we don't think they're good or advisable. 
So if you start telling me I have to say these 19 are for the brewery and these are for the Yellow Springs Brewery and these 12 are for Vitruvian, then I don't think that fits in with our philosophy. Um, but if you talk about um, whether or not there's adequate parking for both breweries, there's plenty, and we know the handicap requirement. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Kent, weigh in on this, will you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not quite a teacher with a never do a bar, so I'm just kind of unqualified. <laughs> My my one issue is just like reiterating what Sam was just saying was that if we were to delineate parking at this point, all of Vitruvian parking would be delineated at the very back of the parking lot. So so so, so you what you really want us to do is you just really want us to tell us that you don't we're not going to require parking because we just feel that parking lot is big enough to accommodate just about anything. Well, I, I mean, that's like the Wild West. There is a shared, there is a shared use on the parking lot, correct? Yes. And so if we were to delineate parking, I mean, what kind of precedents are we setting? Well, we should have, we should have, I mean, we've been lenient on this all along. We probably should have had their plan from the beginning. And so, so, so I think this is fairly benign, to be honest with you. I think, I think the curbs and and and, and you know you, you're going to drive rebar down in these things into the into the gravel. I, I think I, I think that's a reasonable. I agree that the curbs and and delineating the parking themselves are reasonably benign, but putting a name on it. We didn't we, 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 we didn't say that. Okay. We, we didn't say. Okay. All right. That's, that's my well, issue. At least I, I didn't. At least these guys have that's, haven't. That's my issue. If, I'm gonna, if it's going to be like, oh, this brewery can park at the front and this brewery has to park, okay. we're going to sit at the back of the bus okay. kind of thing. Um, so, so, I know it goes to Kent. Kent, they have to move. Kent doesn't want to weigh <laughs> in on this, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking for an enforcement issue of if they're not in, identified and I was the enforcement officer, I'd throw my hands up because trying to determine. Well, they're, the, well, they're, they're going to give us, somebody's going to give us a plan and they're going to tell us where these are at. And so if we have an enforcement officer, he ought, if he, he ought to know his job. He'll, he'll know what, who's who. And if there's a problem in parking lot, he'll, he'll sort it out. Well, the thing I'm trying to get at is parking in proximity to their location. Or is this parking in proximity to the parking lot? This is parking in proximity to her location. I, I endorse yeah. Sam's approach. The Anarchy RS, that's the one that's crazy. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay, wait, wait. Uh, Tamara has got something to say. Hold on, Sam. Again, the code allows for the planning commission to you know, defer parking, right. um, and they allow you also to modify the parking <coughs> requirements if, if it's so warranted. But they also allow you to require a parking study to document any one of those requirements. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be best served if, if um, the owner provide some type of a plan that's laid out a little more. Not just for the one use, but for the entire yeah. uses on the site. Yeah. Okay. So what? Sam, you wait on that. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had a complaint about parking at Melrose? Yeah. When? I have. I haven't. Okay. When you have one, send them to me. Will okay. Because I haven't had one. What's, okay. What complaint did you have? Well, I can't tell you that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> No, 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 the point is, the point is you, go, you go down there on the weekends, there's cars all over the place. Okay, there's head-in parking on both sides of the driveway. There's head-in parking on both sides of the lot that yeah, goes I, around it. I got you. There's immense overflow parking over toward Fairfield Pike. You know, I just don't see what the problem or issue is. Okay, right. I agree with Sam. What, what do we get with bumper blocks? It's a huge parking lot out there. Yeah. I mean... Okay, 
It's a point of view. I just I understand Jerry saying it, it'll be an enforcement issue, but it's not like uh, it's a very large parking lot, and this is a small facility. You sure you didn't like my suggestion? Can I tell you a story? You can tell a story. <laughs> we need a story right now. I don't know if this is working. You don't say me wrong, and I'm also a principal of Millworks. Um, <clears throat> first time I went down and the Yellow Springs Brewery opened, I was totally amazed because the parking lot was full and everybody was parked in a lot and down right where they were supposed to be. Go that's, figure. Okay, that's because when they come in, they're sober. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to add one more thing, John. Yes, sir. This is that lovely. parking lot has been full. <laughs> But the only time it's ever been full is on street fair day. Okay, right. When we donate the okay. use of the parking lot to Yaw Springs Kids Playhouse generally. If not then it would go to some other charitable Okay. Then they fill it up with street <coughs> fair. Okay, go ahead. To rent the park. Okay. That's all? Okay, this is what I'm gonna do. Okay. G give me give me your your position, Chris. I say we go with thirteen as the number we consider to use a bar. We go with thirteen. Buffer box? No, I don't. I don't see the need for bumper blocks. It's just additional cost for the landowner. What? What? I, okay, thirteen. It's meaningless. Well, it's not meaningless. There's a number of different uses out there that have the different parking requirements. Okay. And there, there is an estimate on what the maximum capacity of that parking lot is. I don't have that figure in front of me. I mean, what's the maximum capacity? Two hundred cars? I don't know. Hundred fifty. I don't have a number. Something. Uh, something. Something. We, we, something. We, we, so we, we, we the calculation could be made. That, okay, we got 13 for this. We've got X many for the brewery. I can't remember how many we have the distillery. Yet. I think it was only three or four or something. So we're really just talking, you're, you're taking square footage of parking lot and, and just determining that you've got, you know. So <clears> my point is that it's not, it's not a meaningless calculation. 13 isn't just some number where it, it, it can be quantified that, okay, at a certain point. Okay. I got you. I got you. I got you. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, I would be inclined to go with uh, one handicap space and using the whole parking the whole uh, okay. area as the space. Got it. Come up with it. Okay. Got it. Tim. The handicap space, and as long as the handicap space has got pavement going from the parking spot to the door, okay. not with gravel in between. Um, no, I, but I'm not really. I just like to say it's the NRP seems to work out there. So. <laughs> Although walking through the parking lot, you can't ride your bike in the parking lot. Yeah. Okay, very, very, very good. Um, Bill. Yes, okay. <laughs> well, obviously the handicap parking spot has to be taken care of. The fact is that Sam and company are going to have a problem if there if there is. Uh, well, an overfilled uh, requirement. There are more cars. The uh, their uh, uh, the people who are working there are going to say, "Now wait a minute, Sam. We we're losing business because we don't have enough parking places." <laughs> and so, you know, ultimately, it's going to fall on Sam and who and the owners to correct whatever problem they face. On the other hand, uh, there is a lot of parking there. It is possible. And certainly we don't want to have it uh, separated by uh, business or anything like that. That would never work in a situation like this. So, uh, but we do need to take care of the, the um, handicap spot. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I've been trumped. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, those that basically would be if I'm thinking the end game here uh, this this conditional use would be approved with the condition that they provide one paved handicap parking spot okay save to the entrance building okay. 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 to the entrance. entrance of the building okay Okay, somebody want to articulate that in a motion. Should we address the hours? Do we want to? Yeah, we can do it. 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 We
between five and midnight. Declare it's the same as the yellow spoon. Yeah. 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 If you do that, I can pull it. I, mean, I can have the hours for you on the Can we do that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so who, who's making this motion here? Okay, I'll try to make the motion um, that the uh, uh, conditional uh, use request is granted, providing the handicapped spot be <clears throat> properly installed to the door. And uh, the hours of operation will be the same as the Yellow Springs Brewery. Is that and to clarify, the hours of operation don't have to be identical, just the, the maximum the, window, yeah, 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 which window. window be open. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, now we have discussion. Any discussion? Okay, well then, let's do the roll call. All right. Yes. Petco. Yes. Toby. Yes. Sim. Yes. Till. Yes, but I also want to say congratulations. I think it's great that you guys are here. It's been a long and winding road for you guys. And okay. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. Now, we have one more conditional use application. You guys are done here. Um, okay, so here we go. Here we go. Um, this this next one is Antioch University Midwest conditional use application for a mobile vending food truck at 900 Dayton Street. Um, Camera, do our staff report. Are you here with the university? Are you here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is a, a conditional use request um, from Antioch University. Sorry, from Antioch University Midwest, and they're located at 900 Dayton Street and they're in, within the Educational Institution District, and the applicant for this conditional use is Karen Schuster Webb, and the um, request is for a conditional use permit for zoning ordinance 124602 to allow a mobile vending food truck operation on the property located at 900 Dayton Street. The, um, this property is located at the northwest corner of the intersection of Dayton Street and East Union Road. It is owned and occupied by Antioch University. The site consists of one principal structure utilized for education purposes. Parking is provided on the north and west sides of the, of the lot at the rear of the building. And currently access to the parking lot is from East Union Road. However, future development of the land to the west provides to, uh, plans to provide an access means to uh, Dayton Street. And again, the property is within the Educational Institution District, which was established to support the needs of the post-secondary education institutions <coughs> within the village. The applicant, again, has provide, um, applied for this conditional use because they want to uh, have the operation of a mobile vending food truck for the purposes of providing meal and snack options for their students and staff members. The mobile vending food truck would be located within the parking lot located behind the building and only operate during normal campus hours and during special events. Antioch University provides 295 parking spaces, including the 21 handicapped accessible parking spaces. The current zoning code requires a college or university to provide one parking space per classroom plus one parking space per three students based on the maximum of number of students attending classes at any one time. Therefore, under today's code, only 198 parking spaces are required. The mobile vending location is in, a, is in a row with 14 parking spaces. If the location utilizes all 14 spaces, there would still be 281 parking spaces available. The, um, under the table, uh, the schedule of uses um, for the Educational Institution District, 
local vending food truck is a, a permitted as permitted as a conditional use. The um, in addition, we have specific requirements for mobile vending food trucks in section 1262.08D1, and they are A, food trucks may be permitted to operate within the um, B1, E1, and I2 zoning districts. B, the food truck shall be located only within an approved off-street parking lot, provided, um, provided the food truck shall not displace any required parking spaces. C, the food truck shall not be located <coughs> closer than 10 feet to any driveway. D, outdoor seating may be permitted provided written permission is obtained from the property owner and the seating area does not displace any required parking spaces. E, amplified sound and freestanding signs shall not be permitted. F, the food truck shall be stationary at all times when open for business. G, the owner or an employee shall be present within the vehicle at all times while open for business. H, access to restroom facilities must be available. I, the owner or operator of the food truck shall provide trash receptacles other than public receptacles. J, all equipment and other outdoor seating shall be inside, attached to or within three feet of the food truck. Evident, and K, evidence of Green County Health Department approval shall be provided. L, disposal of wastewater shall be into the sanitary sewer system. The use of storm drains or any other form of discharge is prohibited. M, the conditional use approval shall be reviewed annually by the village manager to ensure compliance with all standards of this section and any other conditions that may have been imposed upon the original approval. Um, section 1264 and talk about, uh, I show you the calculations for the parking and uh, the institutional uses such as universities, again, they have to have one space per classroom, uh, one parking space for every three students. And I just looked at the website to determine what their maximum enrollment was and uh, that's where I came up with the uh, 198 spaces that would be required. Um, they have 16 classrooms. And um, the enrollment that I saw online was 545 students. And um, it may be accurate or it may be a little different. So, but either, either way, they have adequate parking. The, um, let's see, because currently we have 295 spaces and 21 handicap spaces. So, and again, we have the conditional use requirements and the general standards are the same as they were for the other two and also the conditions of approval. And the staff recommendation is that um, we have no concerns and we recommend approval. Okay. Any questions for Emma? Okay. Um, it's time for the public hearing. No, no the applicant. I keep, I keep doing that. Applicant needs to come forward. <laughs> Good evening. I'll make this very short. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before the Planning Commission. Uh, we very much would like uh, approval and seek approval uh, for our students, our staff, our faculty to have the opportunity to uh, engage with mobile vending uh, on our property. And um, we really have done due diligence to make sure that it will uh, comply with the standards that you require. Okay, thank you. Any questions for that? Okay, yeah, it's time to come here. <laughs> oh, go ahead, John. Okay, I'll open this here. And anybody have anything to say? Oh, we do. I'm just. Okay, oh, thumbs up. He's just doing thumbs up. <laughs> I guess we'll close this public hearing. <laughs> oh, I thought, I'm sorry. I, I, I have a question. Yeah. Is that okay? Sorry, All I right. thought those were raised hands. Like Come everyone just. Come on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Lauren Heaton from the, the news, and I, I wondered about the um, issue about retail in this area. I, I, I don't know. I, I know that there was you know, some diligence done to pr provide that there would not be like retail stuff going on in that area, and I just wondered how this. Speaks to that issue. Um, yeah, yeah, I can address that. Go ahead, Tamara. Antioch University does not provide the, um, you know, their own cafeteria service, and what they're providing is not retail service to the public. They're only providing this service 
directly for their students and their staff. And you know, having it behind their building, it's not going to attract you know the public to that area for the you know the normal type of retail that you can have as retail. So you're saying members of the public won't be allowed to go there? They're going to card people to assure that they're <laughs> students? No, I'm serious. No, I'm sure that if somebody had stopped in there, you know, the vendor's not going to card them. But it's sort of obscure. I mean, I just don't think that people are going to be, you know, directly going there. And also, and, and also what I was told in our discussions with this, they've actually been trying to do this since well before the, the, the new code took place that it wasn't allowed under the old code, so they had to wait. And uh, what, they're, what they're suggesting and what we discussed was that their students are coming from, you know, a lot of the students are coming from the western part of the county, and they're traveling there. By the time they make it their class, they don't have time to make it downtown and back, even when they have their lunch breaks to do that. So it would not be detracting from the downtown uh, retail sales areas as well then. Sold. You know, one of the things that you could do is you could you could attach a condition and, and just simply articulate that this is will not be for private use. Yeah, public, public use. Public use. Public. Okay. And, and that way if there's ever a problem, okay, if this thing gets out of hand, mm -hmm. then they could basically uh, lose their conditional use. Okay, if they don't, of course, go ahead. Um, and they are talking about for special events also. So there yeah. may be times where you're going to have family members and, you know, friends of students coming along for some special event at the university. And, you know, they're likely going to use that yeah. truck, but the truck itself can only hold so much. Yeah, right. Yeah. Can we just Sorry, this guy back here. <laughs> I, I came for the solar, but when I saw this on the agenda, I was an adjunct professor the last two falls at in Upper West, and I really enjoyed doing it. But in that time, I noticed that a lot of my students would come to class at seven o'clock hungry because they're traveling from their jobs, and you know. And I, I also noticed that I too arrived at the site, and so this to me <laughs> 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 no, that's right. What the hell is that about? So um, I think it's a. I just want to say that it, it, what you described is a real uh, experience I had. So. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, Jim. Okay, Jim Malarkey. I live in town, and I've worked at Anak University for quite a while. Um, I, I, I believe that for our students it's really important because of the reasons mentioned, but also because of the inclement weather during the winter. It's hard for people to get into a car, out of, try, to, try to go downtown or out of town, find a parking place, order some food, wait, get, come back again. Um, what happens is that by the fall, students eat the rubbish in the vending machines. That's not good for their health. Um, and it's also not good for our institution because they're stunned to find there's a, a, a university that has no place to eat. What kind of place is that? Uh, there should be a place a person could get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, a sandwich, a, a bowl of soup, something like that, or a burrito, whatever sold on the, on the truck. Um, you can't stop people from coming in from the outside who want to have a bite to eat from our vending machines, okay? And so you probably can't stop them from going to the truck. Um, but that's not the intended purpose. The intended purpose would be for, as stated, our staff, our students, our faculty, to be able to get some nourishment when they need it so they can carry out their duties as learners and educators appropriately. As things stand now, we cannot. We're continually disrupted by the need to go find food somewhere else, okay? And if you do try to go downtown to get something to eat on Saturday, might take an hour and a half because there are lots of lines and traffic and so on and so forth, which is a very good thing. Right anyway. okay. <laughs> Anything else out, out from? Okay, yeah. Um, Close not public hearing. Public hearing is closed. Um, yeah, it seems to me that, I mean, this is, this is where I'm going. And, you know, we, we can address that concern in terms of, of uh, who it's for just in an, enforce, in an enforcement um, category, or we don't even need to deal with it. So give me some guidance. Chris. Uh, with respect, I am opposed to this application. When that land was first developed, there was a great deal of concern that uh, 
I want to be a strip mall out there, or something that would uh, compete with uh, the downtown retail district. I mean, there's all sorts of assurances issued that, well, this isn't going to be a strip mall. And of course, it's not a strip mall out there. There's a college out there, and uh, there's going to be some industrial uses. But uh, there's always been a concern in town that there would be a strip mall that would roll in and compete with our uh, beloved downtown. Now, certainly there is a history of uh, mixed use in Yellow Springs. There was a, uh, a second retail district on South High Street uh, in years past, but this is not a traditional uh, area of uh, retail uses. And Yaki University made the decision some years ago to move away from the heart of the village and, and move out to, to the edge of town. They also made a decision to build a college without a cafeteria. Specifically, I think this proposed uh, use is not consistent with uh, the village comprehensive plan uh, from uh, the general standards of uh, conditional uses. One of the points of the comprehensive plan is that uh, development would support the downtown, would maintain the downtown as the, uh, the heart of the village now, the retail heart of the village. I understand, John, you're saying that uh, conditions could be put on this to assure that only students and only f faculty could uh, could use it. Uh, and several of the professors, adjunct professors, said that there is uh, a problem out there right now. Um, but uh, I sure don't think having a little mini re you know, retail district out uh, West to East Enon Road is a solution. And I love food trucks. Isaac back there, he loves food trucks. I love food trucks. I eat flea market food. I, you know, I love getting food. It's cheaper for one thing, you know. I'm a big fan of it. But uh, even more than that, I don't think there should be any retail uses west of uh, East Enon Road. And I see this as a, as a retail, okay. as, a, as a restaurant on wheels. Okay. okay. Jerry? Uh, I concur with the staff's, staff's findings and recommendations. Says approved. Sam? I agree. I think it's a great idea. And uh, I don't think it's retail per se. I don't think you have a concern about the strip malls going in out there. But uh, all the strip malls. Yeah, I, I, I agree with the staff recommendations. Okay, Bill, I don't care how old you are. If you go to class and you're hungry, your, your belly is going to say to yourself, I'm not sure I'm listening. I'd much rather the students have, have food available. And I recognize that the, uh, uh, you know, what's happened in the past and how the school was uh, formed. But I think re the reality is that we do need to have some kind of reasonable food out there. And, um, so I, as far as I'm concerned, the staff recommendation will be fine. OK. And um, and I agree with the last three. However, I think that, uh, Chris, you want to suggest that there be prescriptions just, just to make sure that there's a, um, yeah, that, that, that the public, if the public thinks that they can get used to this, that they can't. In other words, if you think you can run out there and get a sandwich, um, you might be able to get away with it, but if, if this thing gets out of hand, we'll yank their conditional use. Or do we want to also establish how many trucks can be out there at any one time? You're only asking for one, right? Correct? Okay. That's so I know the brewery has the, their food trip that comes out okay. there, too, so that's not right. such a good Only one at a time. I mean, Chris, would that make you feel any Better. Oh, John, I mean, I'm going to feel fine when I leave. <laughs> I'm opposed to it. It's a restaurant on wheels. I think that uh, that a uh, number of students and faculty, they do find the time to go downtown okay. to get their meals, and now they're not going to go downtown. Okay, very good. Okay, I think I can entertain a motion for this time. Do, do you want to set hours? Well, it's spelled out in there. It's, it's, it's doing uh, campus hours, I think it's said, in uh, special events. Doing normal campus hours and doing special events that we're going to be out there on this day. Well, okay. That's fine. It, 
broad, though, depending on your including classes times or faculty times. I'm just sort of speaking to whether Chris has a concern there. No, now's your have, chance. They do have evening classes, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, if John had, I mean, I'm, even if it did have some writer on it, I, I just, uh, I'm against it, so I, yeah, okay. so it's not going to Okay. Yeah, if you want to put some writing, some more details on it, that's. Oh, I'm a law and order man, so I, I would do it. But I, uh, can, can I make a motion as a Yes. So I'm, I move we, we accept the uh, proposal as written and uh, as uh, recommended and approved by our staff. And I'll second the motion. Okay, any further discussion? Okay. Yes. Toby. Yes. Till. No. Beko. Yes. Sims. Yes. Okay. Um, this we use has been approved. Yes. Uh, we don't need new events tonight. Well, you know what? Actually, you do because <laughs> I I have to. These are necessary for the uh, CDE. You need the minutes for the conditions of the CD. So it's four pages. I don't think it'll take long. Uh, okay. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, okay. We're gonna re we're gonna we're gonna review the planning commission minutes, and they're amendable okay. to improve accuracy and clarity. We're trying to go through minutes. <laughs> Page one. Thank you for your service. Page two. Page three. Okay. I move for German. No, oh, no, 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 no. You have to, you <laughs> to, you have to, minutes, you have to move to approve the minutes okay. as submitted. I, 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 uh, I, I, I move that we accept the minutes as submitted. Do I have a second? Yes. Okay. All in favor? All in favor. Aye. Aye. Your enthusiasm is crushing. Abstain. Yes. Okay, now. Yeah. Agenda planning. You guys, uh, I just going to bring up a point. When I talked to the lawyer after yeah, this thing, he brought up an issue about YouTube. YouTube may be required to come back. And I'm gathering on my calendar. Yep, same here. And, and so that date's okay yep. if, if, if that happens. Yeah, okay. As long as you remember to send you the, the stuff like that. Okay, you got you, you got it? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so agenda planning, we, we have continuance of the conditional use hearing. Um, it's our deliberation process. Um, and uh, so that's it. Okay. Can this be considered a special meeting? Yes. 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 So you to notify the papers. Maybe. Okay. okay. So um, do I have a motion for adjournment? I move we adjourn. Second. <laughs> it's a non-debatable uh, thing. So all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, meeting's adjourned.